This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. The next speaker is Evan Eichliff, the University of Washington, speaking about segmental duplications and deletions. Well, thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks, Ajit and, and uh, Elaine, for organizing such an interesting and I think still topical uh, area of discussion. Probably will be topical for the next 50 years. But uh, my perspective on this has really been from a slightly different uh, point of view. Well, we've talked a lot, and we'll hear more about single nucleotide variation. Roughly the last 15 years, my lab has been interested in larger forms of genetic variation deletions, duplications, and inversions, and particularly down to the level of about one kilobase in size. And more recently, with the advent of new technologies, we've been able to push this down to even further, down to about 50 base pairs in terms of its size. My initial uh, interest and, in, I guess, passion uh, into this field comes from really the study of historical variation, historical copy number changes, particularly duplications. And it comes from really two perspectives. And uh, I'm summarizing the work of about 60 years or 70 years of others here. But I think they're, they really summarize why I think duplications are so powerful in terms of evolutionary process. The first has to do with functional import. When you duplicate sequences and make extra copies of them, by definition, you free that sequence from evolutionary constraint. So if there's genes within those areas, they can actually evolve. Potentially, new functions can evolve from that. And in fact, duplication is the primary force by which new genes evolve within any species. Whether you're a cricket, a snail, or a human, this is the primary mechanism. The second is really with respect to the structure of the genome. When you create additional copies of duplicated sequences, you now predispose that genome and that area of the genome more precisely to additional rounds of deletion and duplication. This was recognized by guys like H.J. Muller and Sturtevant long before we even knew what DNA was. They observed the bar locus in Drosophila, for example, as being a site of genetic instability that was related to duplication. So throughout this talk, I'm going to touch on both of these, both the role of duplicated sequence, particularly within great apes and humans, in terms of the emergence of new genes, and as also as roles and their role in terms of genetic instability. So a little bit of background. The term I will use is, the, and unfortunately, the title of the talk was segmental duplications. So segmental duplications are nothing more than recent duplicated sequences defined at the genomic level as being pieces of DNA greater than a kilobase in size and with greater than 90% sequence identity. And for the purpose of this talk, what you need to understand is that there are differences in terms of the distribution of these sequences. So sometimes they can be distributed within a chromosome or they could be distributed between different chromosomes, in which case we refer to them as intra versus inter chromosomal duplications. And the other important piece of information is that they can be different in terms of their configuration. They can be separated from their ancestral sequence by large distances, in which case we call that interspersed. Or they can be side by side, in which case we call that tandem. All right, so that's the background. So what does the human genome look like with respect to this property? This is a slide that I often show, but I think it actually summarizes quite nicely the pattern of large segmental duplications within our genome. I'm looking here at only the largest, so greater than 20,000 base pairs, and the most identical, so greater than 95% sequence identical. So these are all evolutionarily quite young. And every little line that you see here represents essentially a duplicated sequence that's duplicated intrachromosomally. So the blue represent intrachromosomal duplications. So two things I want you to get from this. The first is not every chromosome has been treated the same with respect to duplications. Look at chromosome 7, chromosome 16, 17. They've been bombarded by a large fraction of duplications, while other chromosomes have been you know, essentially quiet. The other thing which you maybe can't get from this is that essentially a large fraction of the duplications are interspersed. That is to say, they're not side by side with their ancestral sequences, but they're spread long distances from their kind of ancestral homeland. Now, I'm going to show you the interchromosomal pattern on top of this. 
And this is the pattern when you add the, the exchange of information between different chromosomes that has occurred historically. This might look like complete chaos, but I assure you it's not. There is actually an organization to this. But you'll see that specifically biases near centromeres, represented here by purple, or near the ends of the chromosomes, are particularly prone to this process. So how does this compare to other organisms? So this is probably the best sequenced genome other than human that's available, and that's the mouse genome, and more specifically, a specific strain that we call C57 black 6. And this is the pattern for duplications, recent duplications, at the exact same sequence identity and exact same size. So what's not impressive is the difference in terms of proportion. Mouse genome is about the same proportion of recent duplications, although the sequences are completely different because they're all evolutionary, evolutionarily quite young. But one thing you should see from this is that the pattern is very different from human. You see essentially very few interchromosomal duplications, but more importantly, you see that essentially the duplications that are intrachromosomal, shown here in blue, are right on top of one another. So in the mouse, most of the duplications that have evolved have evolved to be in tandem, or very near to be in tandem. While in humans and in great apes, the vast majority of the duplications are essentially interspersed. So which is the mammalian archetype? So I won't show you the data. We've had the opportunity to look at the genomes of elephants, dogs, rats, platypus, and other marsupials, for example. And I can tell you that an elephant's genome architecture with respect to duplications looks a lot more like a mouse than it does a human or a great ape. So this, in this regard, humans and great apes seem to be the odd man out, so to speak, or the odd hominids out with respect to duplication architecture. So what about the duplication architecture in humans and great apes? Well, in terms of the timing of these events, we've had the opportunity to look at chimpanzee, orangutan, um, and actually other species. More recently, we've sequenced our own gorilla genome to actually get an estimate on, on, on the timing of the different duplications. And this Venn diagram just simply shows you the most recent duplications and how they relate to one another in terms of whether they're shared, i.e., they intersect between a human and a chimp, or if they're specific to one lineage versus another. So this is the total number of millions of base pairs that are involved. So two things that you can get from this, just looking at this map of duplications, which is going back to about 25 million years ago, you can see that the orangutan circle is significantly smaller than that of human or chimp. And this is actually something that we've been able to validate experimentally on a number of different genome assemblies. So less duplication in the orangutan lineage compared to chimp or human. The other thing that you'll see is that the size of the circle between human and chimp that's shared is actually quite large. And in fact, if you go ahead and you try to estimate how many megabases have been added by duplication to the hominid lineage of evolution, this is the kind of tree that we get. Now we've added gorilla in addition to and macaque on this. The top line refers to the absolute number, or the big, the big number here is the absolute number of mega millions of base pairs that have been added. And a smaller number refers to the number of millions of base pairs added per million years. And so the one thing I want you to see from this is in particular right here. Right around the time of the separation, or just before the timing of separation of human, chimp, and gorilla, and we think shortly thereafter, there was a burst of duplication activity. So we have on the order of three times the number of megabases that were duplicated in this ancestral branch before the separation of chimp, gorilla, and human. This is interesting, because if you look at you know, texts that have been written for the last uh, 20 years on this subject, most people have, been, have had this paradox is why is there so few genetic changes over the millions of years that exist between humans and chimps and gorillas? And that is because most of the studies have been done already on single base pair changes and small insertion deletions. In terms of duplication, it appears we have an episodic burst of activity at a critical time, I would argue, during evolution. So another piece of information I want to share with you, and it's actually kind of a model at this point, is how these duplications have grown in complexity, specifically within the great ape human lineage. And I'm not going to share you with all the data underlying this, but essentially reconstructing the evolutionary history of these duplications suggests that they have grown in series. So particular sequences, which we have referred to often as core duplications or core duplicons, have actually moved and jumped to a new location, duplicating a copy of the old at a new place. And then as this has jumped again in subsequent rounds of duplication, it has actually picked up the flanking sequence around it and created an, a now a larger, more complex pattern of duplication. This is subsequently duplicated again, now picking up unique sequences at the flank once again. And so evolutionarily, when you look at these architectures, you'll know a couple of features. Number one, they're not pure, and they're not just not one sequence, but they're actually mosaics of different pieces of DNA that have been stitched together. And the second you'll see is that as you get toward the edge, 
the edges become much younger than the center portion, which is the oldest, which is the core. And there's also exchanges of information that have gone on between these, creating a very complex architecture that exists in our species compared to other primates. So to give you kind of an idea of how complex this can get, this is chromosome 16, showing you a schematic of about 15 locations that are all about 15 million years old or younger in terms of their origin. So if I could go back to my time machine, none of these locations would exist with this kind of complexity. So each little line here, each little, each little color bar represents a different piece of DNA that has been duplicated to this specific location, but it's occurred in series. If you go back and you look at the, this chromosome, chromosome 16, and compare it to, let's say, a baboon or a macaque or any other old world monkey species, what you find is that all of these pieces of DNA exist as a single copy in this particular genome. So if this represents the archetype of humans and great apes, we went from this architecture to this architecture in a span of about 25 million years or less. So adding essentially about 10% additional euchromatin or additional chromosome sequence to chromosome 16 in a very short period of evolutionary time. Really unprecedented from most, most studies of evolution. Similarly, if we look at our cousins, the orangutan, we can see similar patterns where duplications have burst onto the scene. Not as, not as complex nor as prolific as what we've seen, but you'll notice that all of these sequence colors here are different with respect to what we see in human, except for the one, which is the core sequence, which has actually jumped to completely independent locations on different chromosomes uh, during the course of evolution. All right, so why do I show you all this? Well, this architecture, which is having all these duplications that are spread out, that are large and highly identical, creates problems for our genome. And the reason it creates problems is exactly what uh, Ed has already mentioned, is meiosis is fundamental to essentially uh, the recombination process that leads to our chromosomes being different. And the way that that process works, how it knows to find a mom and a dad's chromosome, is by sequence homology. But when you have big chunks of sequence that are virtually identical, you can actually trick that recombination process. So you initiate a recombination of error where, where you shouldn't. And so here are two chromosomes of four that are misaligning during meiosis. And now this big chunk of duplication that's actually separating at two different locations misaligns during meiosis. And now you create gametes that have additional copies of that duplicated sequence or have lost copies of that duplicated sequence. But more importantly, because they're interspersed, everything that's bracketed by these duplications gets taken along for the ride. And now you have gametes that now have additional copies of genes A, B, and C in addition to the duplication or have lost. So this creates a huge amount of genetic diversity in our population. And as a result, it also creates disease. Because when you actually sometimes remove entire swaths of five million base pairs that contain six genes and now you only have one copy, it's not sufficient to actually properly develop. And so years ago, we identified these 130 regions and we systematically have shown by studies of human disease that about 45 of them are important in terms of causing sporadic mutations as well as inherited mutations as a result of this process. And these affect diseases such as autism, intellectual disability, developmental delay, epilepsy, and schizophrenia. So our genome is predisposed to these diseases because of our architecture, uh, essentially, that has evolved. And these are just a few of the microdeletions of the 45 that we've characterized. This is an example of a, a, a very common, it's the second most common cause, genetic thought of autism. Here's an autism spectrum disorder, a deletion of this particular segment. Here's another segment in chromosome 15, which is unstable, associated with schizophrenia as well as epilepsy in the general population, probably one of the most common causes of general, generalized epilepsy in the human species. So this is just going back to that chromosome 16 view. This is the beautiful, complicated architecture that has evolved on those chromosomes. And this is just to show you that rearrangements between these big blocks result in this form of mental retardation, schizophrenia. Rearrangements between blocks 9 and 10 result in syndromic uh, intellectual disability. And this is the, one of the most common causes of autism I already mentioned. It's rearrangements between blocks 12 and 13. So all of this architecture has evolved specifically on our species. So the question that some of you might be asking, I know we've asked this for the last 10 years, is essentially why? Why would we possibly have this type of architecture if it's actually predisposing our population to increased burden and actually increasing our susceptibility to diseases such as autism, schizophrenia, and intellectual disability? And the answer, I think, partly lies in this, is that in these core sequences, it's not just generic sequence, 
but embedded therein are rapidly evolving genes and gene families. And so our group, along with about four other groups, has characterized these gene families over the last few years. And these are just a subset of the genes. Of, there's about six core duplicons that have really carry very rapidly evolve, evolving gene families. And so shown here are some of the genes. This is the first one that we published in 2001. This is a gene that shows extreme positive selection. It actually evolves about 50 times faster than a gene under purifying selection. <laughs> that is to say the additional duplicate copies that are being created are extremely diverse from the kind of the ancestral sequence from which they came. Here's another gene. This is a fusion gene called TRAY2. It's actually been a marker for bladder cancer for some years. But interestingly, it's thought that it m regulates uh, uh, cellular growth, specifically in rapidly dividing cells. Here's another gene de de described by Pierre Bork. It's a RAN-GP2 binding protein. Ancestral progenitor is a nuclear pore. And this one described by Jim Sakella in 2006 is a gene that's been loosely described as uh, essentially a neuro-oncogene expressed in neurons as well as in, again, rapidly dividing, particularly uh, cancer cells. What's cool about these genes is that they have no orthologs, really clear orthologs in the mouse. If you find them, they often don't produce a transcript that's going to be functional. They have multiple copies in chimpanzee and human. They have dramatic changes in their expression profile. So if you go back to an old world monkey species, you'll see them expressed in totally different tissues. And about half of these are showing extreme signals of positive selection. But none of these have been characterized in terms of their phenotype. So there's a big question mark for the function of these genes, largely because they're repetitive in nature. And most of the methods that we've developed are designed essentially to characterize unique sequence and unique genes. So this is just to show you an example of one of these. This is one that we've worked on for the last 10 years. This is a gene called nuclear pore interacting protein. Humans have 20 copies, and some humans have 15. Chimps have 30 copies, but about a third of them are completely different in terms of their location. And what we've been able to do is take the copy that was, let's say, a single copy in a baboon, put them back into a mouse in the back and make it a transgenic, do the same with human copies. And what we found, and this is unpublished, but what we found is essentially that every copy that we've taken back into a mouse from the human shows expression patterns that are very specific within specific cells. So what I'm showing you is a part of the human brain. This is the dentate gyrus. And this is a little, the, the, the staining that you see here is RNA staining. And what we can see is there's a high level of expression of this particular gene family in the neurons, but more importantly, in areas of active neurogenesis. So dentate gyrus, the cerebellar granular layer of the human brain. If you go back and we do the same experiment with a baboon, there's no expression, essentially zero expression in either of these two specific areas. So stay tuned. I think these genes are going to be much more important in terms of understanding human function. The other thing that we can do now, and this is in part because we actually have so many human genomes to compare, we can start asking specific questions, not about shared duplications between human, chimpanzee, and gorilla that may be different in terms of copy, but start asking questions about what genes are actually duplicated in the human lineage. And of those that are duplicated specifically in the human lineages, which of them have become fixed? And so I'm showing you here data from a, a paper we published end of last year, where this is analyzing 155 human genomes for copy number of these duplicated genes. And this is the copy of, that, of a given <laughs> gene shown in Asian populations, European, African, as defined by the genomes that were analyzed in that study compared to, in gray, essentially chimpanzee, orangutan, and gorilla. We also had the ability to analyze the Neanderthal, as an example shown here in brown. But the important point I want to make here is because we've now analyzed 155 human genomes, we can clearly say that these specific genes are duplicated and duplicated only in our lineage. And so these are some of the genes that pop up. I don't expect you to be able to read many of these, but just to give you a kind of a flavor of this, this is a gene called GTF2IRD2. The lesions of this gene have been thought to be important in terms of visual spatial uh, processing uh, in the brain. Uh, this gene, GPRIN2, is a gene important in terms of glutamate-induced neurite growth in the brain. CHIRNAFAM7A is a nicotinamide acetylcholine receptor fusion gene that's specifically duplicated in human. HIDIN is important in terms of fluid uh, transport across the brain, so it's actually a structural protein. And mutations in this right result in uh, essentially hydrocephalus. And SMN, for example, is a gene important in terms of motor neuron maturation. And so the important point here, and this is actually statistical by pretty much any analysis that you look at, the types of genes that we see specifically duplicated in the human lineage are disproportionately important in terms of brain development. And this is my favorite, my last slide example. 
It turns out we have an expert uh, in the audience on this specific gene and actually here at San Diego, a gene known as SIRGAP2. SIRGAP2 is a slit row GTPase. It's a gene, gene, these genes have been known to be important in terms of brain development in every mammal for, 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 for many years. But SIRGAP2 functions primarily to control migration of neurons and dendrite for, formation in the cor cortex, okay? And so it's shown here is a little pictorial taken from uh, Frank Pullo's paper or editorial of it that simply shows that the actual expression level of this particular gene is critical for telling how far a neuron migrates from the ventricular zone up to the cortical plate. So it's kind of a Goldilocks thing got to be just not too much, not too little, and you, you go to the right spot and you begin to actually uh, form dendrites. So here's the cool part. Turns out that there's a gene, this particular gene is an example of one that's been duplicated specifically in the human lineage. We've now estimated that it's two to three million years old. The duplications are large. They're not represented in the human genome assembly. That's because they're large and highly identical. So if you look at the human genome assembly, you wouldn't see these duplicate copies. And what's interesting about these genes, these duplicate copies, is that they're expressed and they're expressed in fetal development. And some data that's emerging may suggest that these could be important in terms of acting as like antagonists against SIRGAP2, helping to more finely regulate when and where SIRGAP actually exerts, exerts its function. So an antagonist of the parental copy. So in summary, I've talked about a unique feature of the human genome architecture, or human grade ape genome architecture, which is this interspersion of duplications. I talked about how, how that architecture is kind of bad karma for us predisposing our genome to really a burden of large copy number variation associated with neurologic and neurobehavioral and neurocognitive disease. I've talked about how that architecture has evolved recently with a focal point on specific segments of DNA that have kind of marched across chromosomes creating this architecture. And I've talked about how those pieces of DNA that are so prolific are associated with essentially genes of unknown function, but genes in which I think are tantalizing in terms of their signatures of selection and evolution. And more, maybe more interestingly, even the fact that they're flanked by human-specific genes, which we know are disproportionately involved in brain function. So with that, I will end. I just want to acknowledge uh, these two folks here, Thomas Marquez and Zoshi Jang. And I actually should also acknowledge Matt Johnson, and whose work I largely presented today. And then obviously great collaborators clinically. And more importantly, I guess I should emphasize the fact that the, our ability to actually study these difficult regions of the genome requires that we actually have genome centers that are still dedicated to excellence in terms of the quality of the sequence that's being generated. And despite the fanfare of next generation sequencing saying that we can sequence thousands of genomes, we haven't still sequenced the first human genome completely yet to understand the true diversity and complexity of our species. Thanks. <laughs>